Here we go. I'll start that again. Welcome to the final Employer Handbook Office Hour. My name is Eric Meyer. I am the publisher, proprietor, and editor extraordinaire of the Employer Handbook blog, www.theemployerhandbook.com. I'm also an employment partner at Fisher Broyles, fisherbroyles.com. And with me today is one of my favorite guests. She's back. She's my partner at Fisher Broyles, and I'll let her do the rest of the introduction for herself. Amy Epstein Gluck. Amy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Eric. As Eric said, I am also an employment law partner at Fisher Broyles, and I'm so happy to join you today. Excellent. Excellent. I just switched the view, so I think this will be uh, better on the recording, I hope. Um, I didn't remember to hit record, right? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. I'm still letting a few more people in from the waiting room. Um, as we're going through our housekeeping measures at the top, let me, before I forget, remind you that Amy and I are lawyers, but we're probably not your lawyers. I think I see a few clients in here, but still, nothing that Amy and I say, even though we're lawyers, is it should be construed as um, legal advice. Uh, we're not trying to create any attorney-client privilege. If you need legal advice, don't get it from a free Zoom. Uh, pick up the phone, call your lawyer, pay for it. I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be better than anything that we have to say today because we're going to say a lot of it depends, although maybe that strikes a chord with you and what it's like to call your lawyer. So uh, can't control that. But we'll do the best we can to answer questions. If you have questions, hypothetical questions that you're asking for a friend, Please put them in the chat window uh, or use, excuse me, use the chat feature at the bottom center. There's a little chat button. You can also hit Alt H and uh, you can chat. Um, and we'll get to as many questions or comments as we can. But Amy and I do have a bit of an agenda to get to. And I'll say that in a nefarious way, I'll say that in a, in a nice way. Uh, Amy, there were two new Department of Labor field assistance bulletins that they snuck in there at the end of the year um, that may interest uh, a few of the nerds sitting in here today, though it interested me. Um, should we talk about, why don't you talk about the, the posting notices electronically? Because I guess that strikes a bit of a chord with us. Um, yeah. We work for the largest distributed law firm in the world. So you want to talk a little bit about that? We do. Um, so yes, this has a particular interest to me. Um, yesterday, not to be last minute or anything, the Department of Labor dropped Field Assistance Bulletin 2020-7 concerning electronic posting for purposes of the FLSA, the FMLA, the EPPA, the SCA, and the DBA. Those are a lot of acronyms, huh? I don't even know what all those stand for. <laughs> I'll fill you in. So right. what the issue is, is if you have a virtual workplace, if you had it before, like we do at Fisher Broyles, or you have it now, what are your posting requirements? You know, it's not like you can put posting requirements up in your kitchen, in your conference room, in your common room or anything like that if everybody is working remotely, if your entire workforce is working remotely. So the Department of Labor provided some guidance and then provided some general guidance and then took each of these statutes that I mentioned one by one. I'm talking about, I gave you all those acronyms but I'm talking about the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, if it applies to you in your workplace, Section 14C of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, and the Service Contract Act, which only applies to government contractors. Some of these are required workplace postings. Some, it depends on your workplace. So what this Department of Labor bulletin said is that electronic notices can be okay depending on your employees and how many are working from home, who's working from home, who's not. They said in most cases, the electronic notices can supplement statutory and regulatory requirements that you post a hard copy notice in your common room or kitchen or rec room. 
but it's an employer's obligation to make sure that everyone affected gets the posting and whether or not you can just email it to people or put it on your company intranet site or something like that depends on the language of each of these statutes and whether they require employers to post and keep continuously posting these, these notices. Yeah, one thing I saw in the, or what I guess I didn't see in the field assistance bulletin from the Department of Labor is what happens if you have a hybrid workforce? That is, you have some people who come yeah. to the each day. So we know we have to post something there, hard copy. That's easy. And we have people that work remotely and ideally we'll put a copy of the notice on the intranet or we'll email it to them or something so we make sure they see it. But the FAB didn't address any obligation on the part of the employer to actually email or um, post the notice electronically for the people who work remotely. So I, I took that to mean that if you post something in the break room at headquarters, which is where most people work, they mm -hmm. basically discharge your obligation. And if the people who work remotely don't happen to see it, so be it. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but no. that's, did you take away the same thing from that? Amy, or am I reading too much into it? You know, I, I don't think that it, it doesn't really gel with the spirit of the bulletin to say that if nobody's working at headquarters or in the office or at the work site, um, leaving the notice in that physical space is fine. You know, if your entire workforce, if most, most of your workforce is working remotely, you want to convey it to them in a way that they'll get it and see it and have it. You know, that can be done easily through a payroll provider as well, you know, especially for your non-exempt employees who are logging in and out every day. But what the bulletin did say, I agree with you that it didn't provide a hard and fast rule in terms of hybrid workforces. But what it did say is, you know, electronic posting is acceptable if all of the employees were exclusively work remotely, all employees customarily receive information electronically, like if that's the main way, the sole way actually, because it says exclusive, it says customary. So if they mostly receive information electronically, and if they have readily available access at all times. In other words, you can't make your employees work for it. You can't make them work to find out where these postings are or to request these work, these notices. It has to be right there when they're logging on. Did you see that? I did. I did. Well, what did you think about the other bulletin um, about using telemedicine to establish a serious health condition under the Family Medical Leave Act. Well, we were talking about this beforehand and, and we agree mm -hmm. it's about time, right? Yeah. So, you know, telemedicine has been around for, for quite some time. Employers, I, I remember, I think I can go back at, at least five years when employer, when my, when my private previous employer was offering that as a benefit, really pushing it on. Like, hey, you know, if, if you're not feeling well, um, you got a stuffy nose, you got a sore throat, something like that, take advantage of telemedicine. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, you get the video chat. Um, and earlier this year, um, given the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Labor said, look, um, we recognize that it's really not practical to force people to go to the doctor if they have something wrong. Um, and let's pause there and just back up for a second. What, what, is, what is the magic about going to a doctor in the FMLA? Well, it gets into the definition of a serious health condition. And in order to be FMLA eligible, um, you have to obviously you have to work for an employer that has 50 or more employees and 20 or more calendar weeks in the current or preceding year, right? So you have a, you have a covered employer, right? And then you yourself have to work for the employer for a year You've got to have 1,250 hours of uh, work under your belt um, as of the time you're going to take your FMLA leave. And you've got to work at a location that has 50 employees within 75. Check all those boxes. And if you yourself or a loved one, for example, have a serious health condition, then you can take FMLA leave. 
12 weeks, up to 12 weeks in a 12 month. That's of unpaid leave. Unpaid leave. So now we get into what is a serious health condition? Well, one way you could have a serious health condition is you have a mental or physical um, impairment, uh, malady that puts you in the hospital overnight. You go to the ER, you spend a night in the ER, you got a serious health. All right. The other thing, the other option is if you're, you're, under, you're under a course of treatment from a healthcare provider. So what is treatment? Traditionally, treatment is going to the doctor. It's not a phone call. It's not an email. It's not a text message. It's not even a note. Um, it's, it's, you know, going to the doctor, look at, looking at the doctor in the whites of his or her eyes. But earlier this year, the Department of Labor, as we were talking about before, said, look, telemedicine, you can still see the doctor. We're not going to force people to go there. So for this year, for, for 2020, we're going to say telemedicine video counts as treatment. That satisfies it. Um, and yesterday, the Department of Labor said, you know what? This telemedicine thing's going to be sticking around for a while. And people like doing it instead of the traditional getting up, getting in the car, going to the doctor. So we're going to count that when considering whether something qualifies as treatment. Now, there are a couple of conditions you pull out my cheat sheet here. There are a couple of conditions on telemedicine, right? So you got you to check a couple boxes. And here are the boxes you got to check. Telemedicine is considered an in-person visit. So the same as going to a doctor, traditionally under FMLA. But it must include the following, okay? Here are the three things. It, there's got to be an examination, evaluation, or treatment by a healthcare provider. So if you're calling up your doctor, your family, friends, and you say, hey, you're coming over this Sunday to watch the, uh, watch the football game, not going to work. Even if you do it on video, not going to work. Um, so there's got to be some actual treatment going. The second part is telemedicine has to be permitted and accepted by state licensing authorities. I'm not licensed to practice in all 50 states um, or Guam or the District of Columbia or Puerto Rico or anything like that, but I'm not aware of any state that or Commonwealth um, that frowns on telemedicine and says it's no. I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's a given for everyone that all state licensing authorities permit it. And then finally, the telemedicine has to be by video conference or actually the DOL says generally should be performed by video conference. So it's not, it doesn't have to be, but generally should be performed. I can screw that as basically has to be. Um, so communication methods that do not meet these criteria, for example, telephone call, letter, email, or text message are insufficient by themselves to satisfy the definition of an in-person requirement for treatment. Basically, that's it. Um, that, yeah, that, that's the short of it, or the long of it. I, I was kind of long-winded. Hey, Eric, what do you think, breaking that down, it says to be considered an in-person visit that, you know, looking at the language of the bulletin, it says these are the things that must be included. And then says, you should do it by video conference. <laughs> right. Come on. And, I mean, and how are employers practically going to know if it was done by video conference? I see somebody else just had that same idea. I mean, do you think employers this year have been overly um, specific about understanding that, you know, given the pandemic, given, you know, all of the dramatic events of this year and some tragic events of this year? Yeah. So if you're the employer, right, how, how understanding are you going to be? You know, how are you going to check that box? Well, one way I suppose you could do it is you could take the DOL form, right? The DOL form is, is a suggested form, but it's not the gospel, right? If you want to tweak it a little bit, you can. So if you wanted to add a box to that form to say, you know, I uh, received treatment through, check the right box, in-person visit, telemedicine. I mean, that's, that's I suppose, one way you could do it or have the, or have the, the healthcare provider check off that box. The healthcare provider is gonna fill out the form anyway. 
regardless of whether it's it's telehealth or um, or an in-person visit. So, you know, someone can check off that form, uh, check off that box to affirm that we have a telemedicine visit with with video. And I would think that would be the same, you know, if you're it's any serious health condition that's medical or mental health. You know, um, if you're seeing your therapist by um, by video, I think that that would that would fall under the same category. Yeah, and, and someone posted, uh, you know, this is a, this is a good point. And this maybe this is why it's not necessarily mandatory um, that it's a video conference. Uh, you know, what about mental health? We're seeing the person is critical, i.e., a therapist treating someone with severe depression. Um, Again, if it's an ongoing course of treatment, I, I think you're, pro you're, you're probably okay. At some point, the, the therapist does need to see, I mean, does need to see the patient. Um, but if it's an ongoing course of treatment, then I don't think that each time necessarily has to be um, an in-person or a, a telemedicine, telemedicine visit. But I don't know. This, some of this is catching me a bit flat-footed. It came out yesterday. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so um, have we have we um, exhausted exhausted this, and should we move on a little bit to uh, sure. how, what do we have next on our agenda? I have should employers require vaccines? I <laughs> think that's another topic that's been that's been not controversial at all. I had a I, there was a question that came in though. I want to talk. Let's just talk a little bit about vaccines um, because you know we, we've read plenty of blog posts about about vaccine, the EEOC weighing in on vaccines and whether employers should require, but you know, this is video, so this is new ground. We'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but a question came in, an interesting one. Person wrote to me, said she, she or I think it was she, um, runs HR for an emergency medical service, okay? So they are making vaccinations a requirement of the job. You know, you're on the front line, you're your healthcare provider, you need to be vaccinated or you're not working. They're making the vaccination a requirement. The question was, if we decide to allow employees to take FFCRA leave in the first quarter of 2021, can we condition leave on having gotten the vaccine? That is to say, if you don't get the vaccine, we're not going to get, we're not going to allow you to take FFCRA leave. I realize this isn't going to apply to everyone on this chat, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't have to be in the healthcare field for it to apply. Maybe you're thinking about requiring, FF, requiring vaccinations and you make widgets. Um, can you condition FFCRA leave in Q1 on getting the vaccine, what do you think? It depends. We talked about this too. Yeah. So let, we'll give you a, a little hint on this. Um, when you call your friendly employment lawyers and you talk about, you know, um, being able to terminate someone for this reason or that reason, or, you know, one of your employees is complaining, we talk to you about not doing anything that discriminates against anyone based on the terms and conditions of employment. So something Eric and I were talking about earlier, I would think that conditioning the right to take BICRA, which is now optional, would really fall under that category. And if you're going to require people to be vaccinated, you know, whether you are or you're not, and you've handled those, you know, you've looked at all the angles governing that decision, you know, it, it makes more sense to treat it evenly and consistently with your employees, as opposed to not providing it to people who don't take the vaccine. I think you're, we think you're really opening yourself up to, to issues. Yeah, I think the threshold, the threshold matter there is, look, if you're making the vaccine a requirement and someone's not getting the vaccine, 
Why mm -hmm. do we need to employ them? I mean, why do we even get to the point where FFCRA is even an issue, right? Now people are, I love these, I, I love these. The questions. I love the questions. I love the attendees. I love the readers of this blog and their friends and clients who are saying, what about the ADA? What about Title VII? What about accommodations? And those are great points. And we should touch on those briefly. Um, and what about incentivizing people to get the vaccine instead of making it mandatory? So let's kind of go one, one, two, three. Um, yes, of course. Um, if you have employees who have disabilities or have religious objections to getting the vaccine, right, you're going to go through that accommodation interactive process to discern whether there is a reasonable accommodation that is available to enable that person to perform the essential functions of the job without getting the vaccine, right? PPE, that's a possibility. Working remotely, that's a possibility. A uh, different shift or something like that where, you know, there aren't other people around, that's a possibility. Um, leave from work, I suppose that's a possibility. And we come up with any, any other number of, of, of possibilities. Um, so yeah, I mean, accommodations are, are, are definitely a, an important factor here. Um, someone who just flat out objects because they just don't feel comfortable having the government put a needle in their arm. You know, I, I'm not, I don't know what's in that vaccine. They're, they're going to, uh, it's a, there's a tracking device in there. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to accommodate that person. The law doesn't require you to, but you know, maybe that's why you make the vaccine recommended, but not required. So you don't have to get into these issues because HR has plenty of other things to worry about. So if someone doesn't want to get the vaccine, we're still going to make everyone wear PPE for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, that's that's another. That's another well, masks, masks, and masks aren't considered PPE. Oh, yeah, so, masks, face masks. Masks, and the other thing, you know, you you raise something that keeps coming up um, with, with some of my clients is you may have to think about these accommodations in a broader sense than you're used to. You know, you, you, you're not going to mandate vaccines for people who are pregnant. What are you going to do with those employees? And in terms of religious accommodations, it's not just talking about organized religion. You know, it's not talking about just people who aren't going to get the vaccine because they're involved in an organized religion and something that you may think is ridiculous or, you know, so out of the ordinary as it can't be covered, you know, the EOC is encouraging you to keep a broad open mind about what constitutes an accommodation for religious purposes. It just has to be a sincerely held religious belief. Amy, there was a, there was a question that popped up. Um, I don't know if this is serious or tongue in cheek, but it's, I, I, I want to address this question. What if you have employees who refuse to return to the workplace unless vaccines are mandatory? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you do? What do you do for that person? Uh, you know, do, do you, let's assume someone, you know, someone call, uh, call from a client. You want to ask first. You want you want to understand first and foremost if there's an underlying condition, or if they live in a household where people have underlying conditions. You know, I think that's it's a step by step consideration, just like everything else. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, because one thing we can be doing now, we we should be doing. Um, as folks are returning to the workplace. Uh, some businesses have had folks back in the workplace. Oh, they've had folks have never left if you're, if you're a uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, maybe over the summer you were bringing people back or maybe, maybe well, not now, but you know, maybe in a, in a month or two, you're thinking about bringing people back with the vaccine is you can put it out there. Hey, folks, if you need an accommodation, right? Disability, religious, whatever, Start letting us know, right? If you got, if, you, if if we can, how can we help you um, as we tra transition back? Put that out there now, right? There's yeah. no problem with that. 
Yeah, I think for HR especially, that transparency, that keeping that communication line open is so key. Mm -hmm. um, another question that came up with respect to vaccines is, let's forget that, that, that FFCRA hypothetical. What if you have a section of your workforce that is outward facing and interacts with customers a lot more? And then you have another section of your workforce that's more inward facing. Um, maybe there's not a, as much in-person interaction, but for whatever reason you're thinking, the ones that deal with customers, I want them to get vaccinated. That's, we're gonna make that mandatory. But the people who work at the home office who, or who work remotely who don't deal with customers, we don't, we're not gonna require the vaccination. What do you think, Amy? Requirements only for certain so, you know, I think that that is going to depend, as your favorite phrase goes. Um, I think that you have to analyze that from, a, you know, an OSHA point of view as well. Is there a direct threat by not requiring certain employees to get vaccinated? I mean, there may not be. I think that considering that and considering whatever legitimate basis you have to have such a requirement, one that's documented, one that's showing that you're mitigating any kind of direct threat to the public, you know, is going to be really helpful there. Someone just asked, if an employer requires vaccination, do they have to pay for it? I think the answer is no. No. Yeah. No. Now, the that said, yeah, employer should pay for it. Um, I mean, unless unless insurance is going to cover it, you know, 100. percent I think a lot of insurance is going to cover it 100. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of employer provided insurance, but yeah, I mean, the employer employer should be paying for it. Um, the employer, I mean, I assume at some point once the vaccine is um, uh, prevalent enough. Um, that employers are gonna do what they did with flu shots. I mean, at my last firm, we'd have a day where someone came in from Quest or you know wherever it was, and, and, and uh, if you wanted to get a vaccine, you filled out a form um, with a little bit of your medical history and uh, you show up, you get in line, you get a shot. And if, and if you don't want the flu shot, that's fine. But at that point, you're probably gonna, you know, you're gonna pay for it on your own. Um, I would imagine a lot of employers are gonna end up doing the same thing with, uh, with COVID vaccine. I'd agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking through to see if there are other questions. And if people have questions, folks, um, again, thanks for being here. Um, I'm, I'm Eric, that's Amy. Um, we're talking, we're, we're, we're talking Department of Labor Fuel Assistance Bulletins and FMLA and COVID-19 vaccines. And we're about to talk about telework as a reasonable accommodation. Um, but if you have questions, uh, put them put them in the chat box below. We'll get to as many as as we can. Um, hey, hey, Eric, do you want to discuss the the whole idea of pre screening? If you're an employer, pre screening for the vaccine and what issues um, people might run into if they're pre screening as opposed to requiring people to go to their healthcare providers for the vaccine. Yeah, sure. So, two things. Um, that, that, that I, I, I can remember from the EEOC guidance. Um, one is it's gonna count as a medical examination. So that means what you're doing has to be a business necessity. And I think it's a pretty low bar to, to, to eclipse here, right? If you're gonna ask employees to go through some sort of medical examination, it has to be business related and, and, and necessary. And it is, right? It is. You want, you want to have a, a safe workplace where you're not doing anything to promote the spread of, of, of COVID-19. Um, you want everyone to be safe. And that's, that's fine. The bigger issue, and I, and I, I think we're at a point where it, it's probably a non-issue, but the EOC flagged it anyway, because we've been through this with, with flu shots, is you don't want to ask for an entire medical history. You don't want to get into, you know, the family medical history, things like that, because then you're gonna potentially run afoul of the genetic information non-discrimination, which limits what you can ask for 
when you're getting into an employee's medical needs. So, you know, I'm thinking back to the last time I got a flu shot. It's, you know, things like, um, you know, maybe does, does one little thing run in your family or do you have uh, it, Guillain-Barre syndrome or something like that? You know, there, there's something, you know, are you allergic to eggs? There are a couple of little things that they ask, which are directly related to the safety of the flu shot um, without asking me whether, you know, I have a, a history of heart disease on my father's side. So it, it, as long as you, um, as long as you, it, it, you it slash doctor, are, are, are tailoring the questionnaires the same way to making sure that the vaccine is effective and safe, I think you'll be, you'll be in good shape. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And the other thing I saw a while back on this chat and I actually had come up with, with a client was the idea of incentivizing your employees as opposed to requiring the vaccine um, and this one apply to the healthcare providers, but incentivizing employees to get the vaccine is, you know, is definitely doable. You know, um, my client wanted to know if I thought it would be considered discriminatory that I was giving incentives to some and not to others. Um, but I think that incentivizing folks to become vaccinated is a really viable and maybe more palatable alternative. Um, someone asked me in the private chat, what would be some types of religious accommodations for those who do not want the vaccine? Um, anything, we, we, I went through a, a laundry list before, you know, face masks um, and, and slash other PPE, working remotely, um, a staggered shift where you're not working around other people. Um, um, is there anything that is unique that you can think of, Amy, to a religious accommodation that wouldn't otherwise overlap with an accommodation that you provide for someone with a disability that can't take the vaccine? Think of anything off the top of your head? No, not really. Um, I think the what's important is you know that you make every effort to continue to engage in the interactive process, which is necessary both for disability and religion, and you know you work to see if there's something that can be done, you know, including putting the person in a separate space or something like that. But, you know, the EOC allows you to exclude people from the workplace if, if they're not gonna be vaccinated. So it becomes a, a big issue for employers who are trying to mandate. The biggest difference between the two that I can think of is what constitutes an undue hardship. So for a disability, the burden on the employer is it's it's pretty high for mm -hmm. accommodation it's rather low we're talking about anything more than a de minimis cost so um you know, having someone work remotely or maybe changing their schedule or something like that could actually create an undue hardship in the religious accommodation context maybe other people are going to start to work overtime things like that to cover for them whereas it wouldn't be much of a problem in the disability context. Um, but I submit to you that having someone wear a face mask is not a problem for, for I. So uh, I think at a bare minimum, that's probably a reasonable accommodation, um, which would work and which would not create an undue hardship in, in either setting. Um, you know, I think all these things are going to play out um, this year. I think this year is going to be full of these issues. You know, we're going to start to see case law on it and all kinds of guidance and um, EOC investigations. Can we talk a little bit about telework? Sure. So before pre-pandemic, employers, I think had a pretty strong argument to say that regular attendance is an essential function of the job, right? Um, you put that in your uh, job descriptions, you insist upon it, it's consistent with how a business is operated, you like to have a lot of in-person meetings, collaborate, things like that. We need people to be there every day. And 
when you document that, when you follow through on it, courts generally don't second guess the need for regular attendance um, and don't second guess an employer's decision to disallow uh, telecommuting as a reasonable accommodation for someone with a disability. Enter COVID-19 and now everyone's teleworking basically, okay? And the EEOC pretty early on said, well, okay, you know, just because teleworking now is a reasonable accommodation under these extreme circumstances doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a reasonable accommodation after COVID-19 winds down. But, but employers may be recognizing some efficiencies right now and some productivity boost that they didn't otherwise anticipate from teleworking. So they should have an open mind and think about, you know, is it a reasonable accommodation going forward? So that's the but, question. And you know, it's not just an open mind. How, how unreasonable is it if someone has to telework? Right. right. I mean, you may lose some of your undue hardship argument if you've had an employee who's been teleworking for these last several months, who has shown that they could still perform the essential functions of the job. I mean, how do you show that that's an undue hardship to allow them to continue to do so? I think that would be tough. Yeah, I think the way you do it is you, you've got to get objective and analytical versus subjective and stereotypical, right? So yeah. someone, I forget who it was, maybe it was Jonathan Siegel, someone posted a, a link to a Washington Post article recently about the pros and cons of working from home and whether employees like it, don't like it, they want a hybrid, do they want to be in the office, whatever. Um, but one of the recurring themes of the article was businesses that were recognizing the light was going on. Wow, employees really are more productive than we thought they would be working from home. Maybe it's the lack of distraction, maybe it's just being you know, less of a commute, whatever, you know, it, it's just a nicer environment, they can control it, whatever it is, people are more productive from home. But there's got to be a way, certainly there's a way to measure that. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I think in, in terms of deciding whether a um, telecommuting is going to be a reasonable accommodation, if you have data to back that up, the efficiency data to back that up, productivity data to back that up, I think you'll have a much stronger argument um, if you ever have to make that to a court. And hopefully you wouldn't have to. You can just say it in a very respectful way to an employee who asks to telecommute that this is no longer a reasonable accommodation. And, and that goes with every blog we write, right? where we say, document, document, document. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're having performance issues with an employee who's telecommuting, if you're having conduct issues, you know, um, or timing issues with a person who's telecommuting, if they have to check in every day and they don't on Slack or whatever, you know, whatever channel, this is, this is management, right? This is employee management. And if you're documenting, you're gonna have a much easier chance. Um, you're, it's just gonna be a lot easier to show, okay, well, this isn't a reasonable accommodation anymore because you, you're not performing the essential functions of the job you know, to the performance standard that it needs to be. And here's why, here are these emails. I think th that's a much more practical way of yeah. doing it than what I proposed. <laughs> I like your way much better, just simple, training managers, reminding managers to document these issues. So that yep. if the issue crops up in the future, I would like to telework because right. I, have, I, I have this medical issue, you remind the employee about how it really didn't work out beforehand. And yep. let's try something else. Yep. Um, so I have next on our agenda, Lessons learned from 2020. And I didn't put any sub bullets underneath that. And I probably should have thought about this a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to like mull it over in my head and, and I'm going to put you on the spot, Amy. 
strange year. <laughs> yes. Strange year. Hopefully yes. you never have to repeat it. Although, I don't know. I want to brag, I did pretty well. <laughs> Well, the best thing to come out of 2020 for me, and then I would like to know for you, is definitely the COVID puppy. Yeah. And if you all want to share your COVID puppies with us, we'd love to see pictures. Yeah. But but just kind of general overarching lessons that, that we've learned from 2020 that we can apply going forward. What do, what, do, what do you think? I would say flexibility. I would say, you know, employers really have had to be quite limber in you know pivoting and everybody's had to really pivot extraordinarily so um i've seen a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion um meted out to employees um i've seen a lot of frustration as well you know when there are concerns about you know employees not following quarantine protocol and exposing other people to covid potentially and you know, traveling and partying like it's 1999, so to speak. Um, so I think that flexibility and trying to figure out the best way to make the workplace work for everyone really is what I've seen be the most successful for employers this year. Yeah. I think that we're gonna see a lot of major changes, which I know we'll discuss in the next section um, but the ability to pivot has been impressive um, and the ability to extend leave when it's needed, whether it's, you know, uh, available or not, has been pretty extraordinary. I was expecting this waterfall of lawsuits. So was I. Lawsuits, um, especially in the fourth quarter of 2020. I just haven't seen them. I, I, I don't know if it's because courthouses aren't operating as they normally are. You know, for you folks who, who aren't dealing with litigation right now, good for you. Uh, <laughs> I haven't stepped foot in a courthouse since February, March. Everything's been on Zoom. I have a Zoom trial scheduled for, for the beginning of February. Um, and I think that may have a somewhat of a chilling impact on initiating litigation um, in this environment. You know, if you don't have to do it now, why not kick the can a little bit? Um, if you're bringing a Title VII claim on behalf of an employee who's been laid off, maybe let the back wages accrue for a little bit, right? You don't have to, you don't have to bring the claim right away. Um, so that could have something to do with it. But I think a bigger reason why we're not seeing these lawsuits in now and maybe in early 2021 is because employers have generally been compassionate with their employees, very understanding as you pointed out, Amy. And a lot of it is about communication, right? And you talk about documenting and pivoting. Um, it's just letting employees know that we're gonna have a safe workplace. You know, letting employees know with vaccines that when the vaccine becomes available, we're going to do whatever we can to facilitate getting everyone vaccinated, right? right. We'll incentivize. Someone asked, you know, what are some exam examples of, of incentives that you could provide? Um, could you give extra PTO? I, I, I suppose you could. You know, could you, um, you know, could there be a, a financial, a, a direct financial incentive? You get the shot, you get, you get the vaccine, we'll give you a hundred bucks. I suppose you could. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head which, which, which says you well, can't. Amazon, little Amazon gift card. Little Amazon gift card. I mean, Starbucks. I know the EEOC has, 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 has dipped its toe previously into the wellness pro, you know, the into wellness programs and trying to regulate those. Um, sure. But they had to pull back. So, go ahead, Amy. I was going to say, whatever you do, somebody had just posted about extra vacation time. This really goes into the holistic view I mentioned before with training your managers. It has to be provided, you know, really consistently. You don't want to go giving, you know, extra PTO to one person and then have a manager in another location deny it to somebody else. 
that could get dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So the one place I have seen litigation this year has been within the ADA context. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Someone notes in the comments. I, I love. I, I, I love the people who attend these. You know, I would. I'm not so sure. Basically, I, I would not recommend the cash because one, it's taxable. Okay. And two. And two, you know, it's possible that it could get factored into overtime rate <laughs> for FLSA purposes. I don't know. I, I, I haven't I hadn't thought it through that much, but I suppose there could be some F, potentially some FLSA implications um, on on. Um, I guess this would be considered non. Well, there's a there's a de minimis analysis there, so yeah. I think it depends. Yeah. We should we should let my dad on to talk about the tax implications. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, I think those are some pretty good lessons. I mean, I don't have any really specific employment law lessons that I think are, are, are that, that, that just popped up in 2020 that aren't specific to COVID. I mean, I think we've exhausted those, right? I'm not going to talk about, um, you know, the type of FFCRA leave form that you should be using. I mean, because if you don't have it by now, you just don't have it. Um, return to work policies, and I think we've been there. Um, mm -hmm. But but outside of the FFCRA context, I mean, we've touched upon ADA. There's nothing really shocking that's come up this year, groundbreaking. Um, FMLA, same deal. Um, although, as we pivot into these 2021 employment law predictions, um, I, I, I touched upon these before on my blog, and I, I'll just... I'll, I'll, I'll pluck off some of the low hanging fruit. All right, 2021 employment law prediction. The National Labor Relations Board starts to become more employee friendly. It's not going to happen yet. In, it, it's not going to be very employee friendly in 2021. I think that's going to be more. I forget the timing of when um, some of the the uh, board members cycle off, and and and, and President President Elect Biden can appoint new. Um, uh, employee friendly board members, but you know, you'll, that, that shift is inevitable. Um, the EEOC is actually going to stay fairly employer friendly through, I think it's 2022, which is when we're going to see some, some openings. Um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more guidance from the EEOC at a faster clip and um, probably some uptick in litigation too. Um, I mean, the surest thing I can predict is that the executive order, the OFCCP related executive order on um, um, respect uh, on, on uh, you know, training about white privilege and, stereo and, 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 and stereotype training and things like that, that's going to be gone in a heartbeat um, once President-elect Biden takes office. Um, longer shot, there was a lot of chatter in 2020 from the FTC about non-competes and how non-competes are a bad thing. Um, and you know, the federal government really hadn't weighed in much on non-competes, but I wonder if in 2021, once things start to kind of hopefully die down very soon with COVID-19, do we see more of a push for elimination of non-competes and then the last thing, and I'll let you talk, Amy, is uh, we're going to get some kind, I would imagine, some kind of paid family leave that comes from Congress. I don't know what it's going to look like, but we'll see some sort of paid family. Yeah, Eric, I mean, I think that that's my number one, I think, and I'll go one step further and talk about more paid sick leave. You know, more and more states um, are requiring paid sick leave or requiring employers of a certain size, whether they're in state or out of state, you know, since I'm, I deal with employees in every state, you know, for the most part, um, and they're just Massachusetts and Colorado now, and, you know, one after the other is really popping up with additional paid sick leave, whether it's related to COVID or not. And I agree with you, I think we're gonna see increased paid family medical leave. Um, it's, such a, it's such a crucial aspect, I think, when for small employers who don't have 50 
employees or, or more in their workplace. Um, and I'm gonna take your prediction one step further and say, I agree that I think Trump's order, President Trump's order doing away with diversity and inclusion training will be repealed. I'm betting it's gonna be required for contractors. I'm betting it's gonna become a requirement for all federal contractors and subcontractors to do some kind of diversity inclusion, implicit bias training, you know, uh, and, and, and the like. I think that the vaccine issues will continue to rage on um, as we've discussed. And I think that we're gonna see more from California um, kind of the whole independent contractor analysis, whether a worker is an independent contractor or an employee under the various laws, um, I think that's gonna to continue to evolve in 2021 as well. So we'll see. Yeah. Wanna do a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Someone just asked me, I don't know if we wanna get into this. Want to talk about the final rule for tip regulations under the FLSA? You think? How? No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Sorry, we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> no. You know, um, talk to me offline. Um, let's see. People, if you have questions, I'm scrolling up. Um, oh, here's a good question. Um, this, is, this, is an, this is an FLSA question. Um, but mm -hmm. not on on the tip rules. And, and, and for, to, I'll, I'll say it real quickly. For, for folks that didn't see it, the Department of Labor issued a, a, a final, uh, a, a rule, uh, which will, I guess, take effect in, in, in 60 days, where if you have tipped employees and you don't take a tip credit, all right? So in other words, maybe you pay them minimum wage um, or you pay them know, 20 bucks an hour or something, and they receive tips, those tips can be, those tips are always the property of the employees. They're never the property of the house, but those tips can be pooled with folks who are traditionally in the back of the house. Right. Not, you're level, not supervisor level, but you're talking dishwashers, cooks, right. uh, uh, expos, people like that, uh, expediters, expos. Um, they can be part of, of, a, of a tip, of a tip pool. And also the 80-20 rule, um, you know, it used to be, you know, 80% of your time was doing one thing and 20% of your time was doing something else. And maybe you wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be eligible for, 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 uh, tip credit and things like that. And, and the Department of Labor just, just get away with that. It's um, a very sexy topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but someone asked, where do you see the independent contractor versus employee going? I think that's a great question because that was a really yeah. issue under the Obama administration. Um, and you saw the Department of Labor working in conjunction with a lot of states throughout the country to really crack down on misclassification of employees as independent contractors. So I could see that firing up again. That's a that's a really good point. And thought. Yep. yep, yep. I mean it, and it's gone back and forth in California so much with um, you know delivery people just winning that battle to, to remain independent contractors. Certain states take a much harder line on misclassification than others and have much much increased regulations about it and some don't. Um, and I think I think federally it's gonna start to to follow how you know become more stricter like California's done. Um, someone, someone put up a note about the, the executive order that the issue, the big issue was that you can't teach people that one race or another is inherently biased. And yeah, I mean, I, I haven't been to, I haven't been to a, a diversity training where someone goes so far as to say that one race is inherently biased. I think most of us can agree, um, that generally that is not a part of, of diversity and inclusion training. I think the bigger problem with, with Trump's executive order, um, and even you know, the chamber took issue with this, is you know, people calling in 
to the OFCCP hotline to say, oh, my, my, my employer is training us about this and they shouldn't be doing that or should they be doing that? It wasn't a very clear set of rules and there was a lot of gray as to what employers should be, you know, can, can say or, or, or what trainers can say or, or, or not say. Like, can you have, you know, can you talk about, um, you know, certain stereotypes, right? Pro maybe, probably. I mean, I, you know, it depends what's in the curriculum. So I, I think it was just trying to eliminate a lot of the gray area um, um, was really the thrust behind removing the, um, the executive order. And it's already been enjoined. There's a federal court, uh, if you guys missed my, uh, I think it was in a blog post yesterday, a federal court in California already entered a nationwide injunction on this executive board. So it's, it's DOA um, for now. Um, other questions, let's see, let's see. Um, are there other questions? I don't know. <laughs> if, you, if you have questions, ask them now because we're gonna wrap this up in about two minutes. We'll, we'll try and get to them. Um, oh, here's someone who asked. For those who have not offered paid FMLA time in the past, is that something being considered in your companies moving into 2021? So um, I'll let people speak to that in the chat. I'll just remind people that the base level is, and Amy said this, FMLA is unpaid, but as the employer, you can require that any bank of paid time off run concurrently with the otherwise unpaid FMLA. So you know, oftentimes someone takes 12 weeks. If they have three weeks of PTO in the bank, the first three weeks of FMLA are actually paid vis-a-vis -vis the PTO. And then the last nine weeks are unpaid. I, right. I wonder if this person is asking, well, will the employer supplement that? You know, will employer supplement that even further by saying, hey, look, you know, we don't want you to have to use up your PTO. Your PTO should be for you, for vacation, for whatever. If you happen to have you know a serious health condition, um, we'll pay you for a couple of weeks. You know, and, a kid you to know, maternity maternity leave, bonding time with the child. You see, you're right. paying for that too. But you want to note the state differences. There are mm -hmm. state mini FMLA statutes, like in Washington D.C., it's 26 weeks of leave. You know, it's not 12, depending on the reason. So you want to be very aware of your state um, and what those requirements are and how they differ from the federal rules. Mm -hmm. Also want to make sure that you're treating gender comes to mind, right? Make sure that, you, that you're treating men and women equally. I mean, this is an area actually where, you know, where the EEOC has, has, has jumped, has waded in with parental leave um, where yeah. Well, employers don't intentionally discriminate against men, but the way they structure parental leave, sometimes it has the impact of discriminating against men. So you want to be careful. I'm not yeah. saying what was men, but but just be careful that that whatever whatever um, compensation structure you come up with, if you're going to have some form of paid FMLA, that it 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 it, it isn't intended to discriminate against anyone, but also doesn't have the impact of discriminating against a particular protected class. It's something you're gonna to wanna to analyze. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm gonna keep that baby someone, gender neutral. Someone asks, and then we'll wrap it up. I guess this will be our last question. If you incentivize the vaccine, what do you do for employees who have exemptions? So if you're gonna, you know, let's say you give a hundred bucks or an extra, uh, a week of PTO or an extra couple of days of PTO for people who get the vaccine. What do you do when someone with a disability comes in and says, look, I can't get the vaccine. I'm willing to wear a face mask. You know, I'm willing to do my part. Do I get that extra day or two of PTO? What do you think? I think the answer is no. You know, I think that the answer is no. I think you've got a clearly defined, you know, program there saying if you get the vaccine, um, we're going to incentivize you and here's what we'll give you, um, you know, and for people who don't, you know, we're going to work with you and we're going to accommodate you so that, you know, 
you can still work and, you know, but I, I don't think that, I think that, that again, creates your slippery slope with some people getting the incentive regardless of whether or not they have an accommodation and some people not. And that was my client's concern with that I talked about earlier. They were concerned that it would discriminate against people who had accommodations. Yeah. Well, these are things that we'll definitely have to tackle in yeah. 2021. Um, yeah. With that, that's a good question. That was definitely, that was a bit of an it depends there. Um, that's a wrap. Um, thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate you coming out on a Wednesday afternoon where I think a bunch of you aren't even working this week. So hats off to you for, for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Um, any, any, any parting thoughts to our, our, our audience? Here? Well, I wanna thank you for having me. I always enjoy our holiday chats. I wanna wish everyone a happy new year and a safe new year. And, um, you know, stay tuned. Maybe we'll do a, we could do like a Valentine's happy hour. I think that that, that could be a thing. Yeah. And I, I look forward to seeing everyone next time. Yeah, I, I look forward to, I look forward to next year. I look forward to doing these again with you and, and talking about, not having to talk about COVID. Yeah, Thank better you. days. Yeah, I look forward to better days. So I wish everyone a happy new year, a healthy new year. A, a successful new year um, and uh, stay safe, which is kind of, you know, you still have to say that for, for a while. And um, for those who are asking, yes, we recorded this. Yes, I will remember to hit, I will remember to turn off the recording. I will upload this to YouTube and, I'll, and, and if you miss some of it, I will post a link on the, yeah. uh, on the blog tomorrow. So thanks everyone for coming out and, uh, Enjoy the rest of your week and the rest of your 2020. Bye. Bye, everyone.